An election where the two frontrunners are Labour members? And where is John Latham? Looks like this election's going to need some explaining. Oops. <laughs> Wrong election. So we're back to another messy election. And right after the election of 1929. This does highlight the problems of unfixed parliamentary terms, something we've still not ratified to this day. Anyway, we have a lot to cover this video, so let's get right into it. In 1929, James Scullin became the first Labour Prime Minister in 15 years, ending the Nationalist Party's continual rule since the First World War. However, he could not have won government at a worse time. If you thought Fisher assuming office during World War I was bad, how about assuming office on the same day the entire global market crashed? The recession that had got Scullin elected had just become a depression. A great depression. From day one, Scullin was all hands on deck trying to fix the economy. As Labour leader, Scullin brought immediate change to federal economic policy, abandoning Bruce's attempts to crack down on union actions and abolishing federal arbitration, instead looking towards new radical ideas such as inflammatory finances and other proto-Keynesian economic ideas, which sought to use government involvement to increase demand in the economy. Despite Scullin's best efforts to balance the budget, without control of the Senate, no budget could be passed without heavy concessions in areas such as welfare spending, which drew outrage from the far left members of the party, particularly in the New South Wales branch of the Labour Party. Scullin's biggest loss would come in 1930, when Ted Theodore, Scullin's treasurer and right-hand man, was forced to resign due to a scandal known as the Menunga Affair in which Theodore had supposedly secretly used his previous job as Queensland Premier to profit from mines in North Queensland. Despite all the chaos occurring, Scullin decided to journey to London, both to attend the Imperial Conference but also to seek out an emergency loan from the British. Scullin was successful in getting this loan as well as getting King George V to appoint the first ever Australian-born Governor-General, Isaac Isaacs. Oh no, not again. Since when has Isaacs been a last name? Getting back on topic, while away, Scullin appointed James Fenton as acting Prime Minister and Joseph Lyons as acting Treasurer. Lyons was a new face on the federal political scene, having served previously as the Premier of Tasmania. He had just entered Canberra in the 1929 election. Unlike Scullin, Lyons supported more orthodox economic practices It was not opposed to the idea of welfare cuts to balance the budget. This made him several enemies in the Labour Party, but gained him many friends in the business sector who began to convince him to leave the Labour Party and join the Conservative opposition. Scullin returned from London to find the most divided Labour Party since the conscription debacle in 1916. In New South Wales, Jack Lang, a powerful socialist, had become Premier and began rallying the New South Wales members of the Labour Party behind him and his radical left-wing policies to recover the economy and on the other side was a contingent of right-leaning Labour members led by Lyons, who wanted orthodox techniques to be used instead. Scullin would then make the biggest mistake of his career. When it became clear that Theodore would not be pr prosecuted for the Menunga affair, Scullin immediately appointed him back to the Treasurer portfolio, which Lyons took as a rejection of his economic proposals, and this led to his resignation from the party, along with Fenton and four other members. Along with this, Theodore was also a fierce rival of Lang, causing more division in the party, which came to a head in the East Sydney by-election, in which a pro-Lang ca Labour candidate won by campaigning against the federal government, leading to both federal and New South Wales Labour expelling each other into two separate parties. While Scullin was losing allies on the left and the right, a new anti-Labour force was forming. Now expelled, Joseph Lyons would join this force, along with former Prime Minister and now Independent Billy Hughes, to unite with the Nationalist Party under John Latham to create the United Australia Party. Oh god, not that! No, I am referring to the real United Australia Party, of which Lyons would take the role as leader. Due to his markability as a family man and a Catholic, as the UAP hoped to win support of Irish Catholics, who almost exclusively supported Labour. The United Australia Party would not be the only party to challenge Labour. In South Australia, the United Australia Party and the Country Party decided to put away their differences and run as the Emergency Committee of South Australia in an attempt to win seats away from Labour there. As 1931 came to a close, Scullin was finally able to begin to implement his economic plan and the economy was beginning to stabilise, although unemployment was still rising. However, relationships did not improve between the two factions of Labour. 
In fact, the growing strength of the Federal Labor Party threatened the New South Wales branch, as the Federal Labor Party attempted to win back support from the New South Wales members. This led the five Federal members of Lang's New South Wales Party to cross the floor and push a no-confidence movement in Schoolin's government, bringing about a snap election on the 19th of December 1931. And the winner was... Joseph Lyons and the United Australia Party, with a massive gain of 25 seats and an incredible 15.2% gain in the two party preferred, thus giving him 39 seats and 58.5% of the popular vote. Originally, Lyons had only won 34 seats, but he would gain the support of the South Australian Emergency Committee, who would continue the union of the South Australian UAP and country members and form the Liberal and Country League, now known as the South Australian Liberal Branch. Lyons' win was so big there was no need for a coalition. After talks between Lyons and Country Party leader El Page broke down, the Country Party and their 16 members would sit on the crossbench. This would be the last time the Country Party was not in a coalition with a non-Labour government. Schoolin's Labour Party had been destroyed, with the loss of over half their seats they were now left with just a mere 14 seats and 41.5% of the two party preferred. Lang's New South Wales Labour had won 4 seats, and would continue fighting the Federal Labour Party for control of New South Wales, while newly elected Prime Minister Joseph Lyons would attempt to recover a country ravaged by depression. Fun fact, Schoolin's Labour government would be the last government in Australia's history to be defeated after a single term in office. Whew, well, that was a long one. Come back next time for the election of 1934.